Greetings and welcome to our webinar uh, today. Uh, this is entitled Piedmont Heart, Changing Lives with DNV ECLS Certifications. And we welcome each and every one of you uh, to this webinar. My name is James Jeffcoat. I manage the cardiac portfolio for DNV, which includes LVAD, heart failure, chest pain, and our featured service line today, ECLS, or otherwise known as ECMO. Um, again, we welcome each and every one of you from all over the continental United States, as well as our colleagues in China. Very much uh, uh, welcome our colleagues uh, uh, across the, the globe uh, for our featured team and our featured presentation today. Uh, Michael, if you'll advance the slide to slide number two. This will be our agenda and our format for today's ECMO webinar. Um, I'll quickly review who we are at DNV and then uh, turn it over to our colleagues at Piedmont Atlanta. With that, let me quickly introduce our panel at Piedmont Atlanta. And I'm going to start with the gentleman that you see uh, in at the podium there. This is Dr. Barrett. Um, he is our esteemed physician, um, and he manages and oversees the CCCU and the ECMO program at Piedmont Atlanta, and he is the medical director for the ECMO program. Dr. Barrett graduated from St. George's University School of Medicine in 1985 and received his board certification in surgery in 1992. He then completed a residency at Yale University. School of Medicine and subsequently became board certified in thoracic surgery in 1995. Following the completion of a fellowship at Yale New Haven Hospital, Dr. Barrett received his board certification in surgical critical care in 2011. Our next panelist is Julian Bass. Julian is a perfusionist at Piedmont Atlanta and he is the mechanical corporeal support coordinator Julian started his career as a registered respiratory therapist until 2013, where he then began his career as a staff perfusionist. He currently serves as MCS coordinator, which involves education, training, and management of the ECLS equipment. Our next panelist is Gloria Glenn. Um, she's a registered nurse and a CCRN. She is the director for cardiovascular transplant nursing at Piedmont Atlanta. Gloria has been a nurse for 17 years, working in cardiac critical care. She's been on the leadership team for three and a half years and has leadership oversight of the cardiac telemetry units, critical care unit, and cardiovascular intensive care unit. Our next panelist is Grant Reynolds, registered nurse. He is the manager of CareLink at Piedmont Atlanta. Grant has been a nurse for over 20 years, working in multiple critical care areas, his leadership oversight includes CareLink at Piedmont Atlanta, which includes the transfer center, house supervisors, rapid response team, the IV team, and the float pool. And our final panelist is Akari Logan. She is an RCIS and has her master's of business uh, administration. She is the director of cardiovascular intensive services at Piedmont Atlanta. Zuccari has been in healthcare for over 30 years with her start as a hospital corpsman in the U.S. Navy. She's been at Piedmont for seven years where she provides critical oversight of the cardiac intensive areas, which includes the cardiac cath lab, the EP lab, the cardiovascular OR, perfusion, and the admit recovery unit. And we uh, welcome our esteemed colleagues at Piedmont Atlanta. Uh, Michael, if you'll advance to the next slide, please. Let me quickly, quickly give you an overview of DNV Healthcare. Um, DNV is a global presence uh, based out of Oslo, Norway. Um, as you can see uh, on this slide, we're the second largest and fastest growing accreditation organization for both acute care and critical access hospitals in the US. Currently, we have over 600 hospitals accredited and certified within the US. We have 15 clinical program certifications, as you see there. Most of those portfolios that house those 15 certifications include stroke, our orthopedic service lines, our cardiac service lines, infection prevention, and more, including glycemic management, which is our newest uh, certification delivered uh, by DNV Healthcare. 
We received our deeming authority in 2008 from CMS. Um, and since then, um, the growth has been exponential and very much welcome uh, with several uh, hospitals onboarding as we speak. Uh, and we look forward to that growth and the continued uh, collaboration that we have with our organizations across the country, including Puerto Rico and China, uh, respectively. We are also one of the few organizations that deploy the ISO 9001 platform in tandem with our accreditation services. Uh, this is a quality management system platform that we deploy uh, that goes in concert uh, with our accreditation. Um, and it uh, certainly provides a exponential amount of gravitas uh, to the organizations uh, as they seek accreditation and maintain accreditation and the quality uh, that the hospitals deliver in their respective communities. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our team at Piedmont Atlanta and our esteemed panelists, and we look forward to this presentation. Uh, and again, uh, please feel free to use the chat function to uh, ask your questions, and uh, we will get to them at the end of the program. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our friends at Piedmont Healthcare. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. And um, we hope that we can provide uh, useful um, information to you. At Piedmont, it's why, why DNB? Well, you just heard uh, Jamie mention that since 2008, they've been accredited by CMS to allow accreditation for hospitals. And DMB's basic premise is to safeguard life, property, uh, and the environment. And that meshes with particularly the, the ISO 9001 meshes with Piedmont's philosophy of continual quality improvement. You always want to be the best that you can be. And you have to keep judging yourself and rating yourself against the best out there. And DNV is highly about quality improvement and continuous process improvement. That's one of the reasons we, we chose, and you as healthcare organizations do have a choice who you want to go to with accreditation. One of the other things that we like about DNV is that if a corrective action is needed, they're open-minded rather than being proscriptive. What that means is this is allows hospitals to pursue a path towards accreditation that meshes with your own values and culture. And finally, DNV has performed significantly better than other hospital accrediting organizations in overall performance, according to the most recent report to the United States Congress as of April 2021 from the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services. So we at Piedmont find this to be an excellent relationship mutually respective, and we're, we're very pleased to, to be uh, on this journey with DNB. Um, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So Piedmont Atlanta, so what are we? We're a nonprofit uh, organization that serves about 3.4 million people in the state of Georgia, in the Southeast United States. We're currently up to 22 hospitals, 18 are currently accredited by DNV and four by the Joint Commission, and they will be crossing over to a DNV certification. We have provided about $1.4 billion in uncompensated care and community, community benefit to the people in our uh, region. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the brand. Sorry, you can go back one, please. Uh, this is our brand new tower, which we are uh, physically in now, which was completed in 2020. We have 86 critical care beds, 116 acute care beds, 10 CVORs, 8 cath labs, and 4 EP labs, and 42 uh, recovery unit bays in this, um, in this building. Next slide, please. All of the rooms here are equipped with bedside computers, scanners, state-of-the-art monitoring, as you can see on the photo, overhead lifts, which can accommodate 700 pounds uh, patients so that our employees and, and 
no one uh, gets back injuries or neck injuries as well. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we participate in the uh, leapfrog system as well, and we have earned an A rating in the last six out of seven uh, um, evaluation periods. We are DNV certified in LBAD and comprehensive stroke. And of course, um, uh, ECLS and ECMO, otherwise we wouldn't be talking to you. Um, we are the eighth largest uh, liver transplant program in the, in the United States and the 10th in the US for pancreas transplant volumes as well. And we're the only hospital in Atlanta to earn the uh, cardiac uh, advanced uh, excellence award for more than 10 years continuously. Next slide, please. So our journey uh, in, in trying to make ourselves continually better, uh, we were the first adult ECMO program in the state of Georgia to receive ELSO gold uh, certification, and we have maintained that since that time. And we are the first DNV uh, program in the United States receiving a DNV certification for our ECLS or ECMO program in 2020. Next slide, please. And this is a timeline of our uh, development. We first began in 2008 uh, and then really became codified in 2012, 2013, uh, realizing that rather than this being, this is wrong term, but um, uh, a, a small, do it as needed basis into a formal program. And since 2013 on up to the present, uh, we have grown uh, exponentially. And again, with DNV and our personal um, belief that we will improve every patient's life that we touch, that we are on a continual process improvement pathway. Next slide, please. So, what do you have to do if you're going to have an ECMO program? Well, you want to establish medical criteria and selection for ECMO candidates because <clears throat> placing a patient on ECMO physically is, is, I don't want to say the easy part, but before you cannulate anybody, you need to know how you're going to get out of ECMO. Because what you have to do is you have to tell every family member and every referring physician and everybody that ECMO is a means of support. ECMO does not treat or cure any disease process. Therefore, you have to have a plan of how to get off of ECMO. And a lot of programs we have seen don't quite understand that. It'll be cannulate them and we'll figure it out later. Don't do that. Figure it out before you put somebody on. And we use evidence-based medical and surgical therapy to minimize adverse outcomes. We provide continual training and support to our nursing staff, respiratory therapists, our APPs, and anyone who touches an ECMO patient. We do participate in research opportunities uh, related to ECMO therapy. This was highlighted by the COVID pandemic when we were one of the very first programs to join the Critical Care ECMO Consortium based out of Australia. We were one of the top 10 enrolling programs uh, in that whole research effort. Uh, next program, uh, sorry, slide. And uh, this is our care model. Uh, we have 24-7 uh, CVICU critical care team, the backbone of which is our APP providers. Uh, APP standing for advanced practice providers, being either nurse practitioners or physician's assistants. And these are extraordinarily skilled individuals who are are constantly present. We're backed up by our perfusion team and uh, our cardiac surgeons as well. Next slide, please. Um, I'd like to ask Gloria to expound on this regarding our uh, nursing staffing for our models. Thank you, Dr. Barrett. So part of our P PAH care model, which is very intricate and we're very proud of, is how we um, have the ECMO patient, as you see, in the center. So all of our disciplinaries and healthcare providers are surrounding that patient. Part of that patient care is our nursing staff. We have our single caregivers that are um, surrounded by ECMO specialists, and they're responsible for the nursing assessment, their plan, the evaluation, and also the care of the patient. Um, we also coordinate care with the, with the healthcare providers. Also, you see we have respiratory ther therapists and ECMO coordinators. 
our respiratory therapists and physical therapists play a great part in the care because we are the, the critical care team is providing ECMO patient support. We are providing ventilation management and also rehab and mobilization of our ECMO patients. And last, you'll see the ECMO coordinator. They are responsible for planning, supervising, evaluating day-to-day -day operations of our ECMO program, and they also maintain the accreditation requirements that surrounds that patient. In the next slide, Dr. Barrett's going to talk to you about our ECMO program volume. This represents a graph of our, um, our ECMO experience. As you can see, again, when we first started around 2008, it was um, do it uh, uh, as needed. It was really not a terribly organized program or codified. But then really uh, starting in 2012, 2013, um, we have become a very highly organized uh, and disciplined uh, team and service you can see the steady growth here. Uh, our volume did uh, dip in 2021 uh, from the COVID pandemic. Basically, we're suffering like every other program in the country. Uh, a lot of our, our people have left for, for travel uh, purposes. And basically, it was um, we did not have enough personnel at that time. And so our volume did go down. But that in the ECMO community was a national uh, ongoing um, difficulty. Next slide, please. Um, so how is this broken up? Uh, we've done about um, just under 1,100 ECMO runs, if I did the math right here. And most of those have been predominantly VA configuration with 574, 277 VV ECMO configurations, and 220 uh, ECPR. Over the last uh, year and a half since um, COVID has been with us, we've done 115 uh, adult ECMO runs for uh, COVID ARDS. Next slide, please. Um, this is, is part of our quality continuous improvement program. Uh, we realized again that um, we needed to uh, keep uh, pushing forward. So this represents, a, as it says on the slide there, an ECMO in-house uh, transport checklist uh, because you will be going to CT scan, not infrequently, for uh, either head CTs or chest CTs. And so leaving home base, as it were, and, and going to a scanner um, can have some problems and difficulties. So we have an in-house transport checklist. We travel with a, a tackle box again because you don't um, you don't want anything to happen in CT scan or wherever you're going. Uh, so we do take our own meds with us. Uh, we do have a stat team that responds to any emergencies, but we figured that we need to take our own meds with us. And then we developed an emergency stop protocol, such as if there were a clot in the pump head or a disconnection or any kind of a event or problem, we wanted to A, protect the patient, and B, then try and protect the circuit as best we could. So we developed an emergency stop protocol. Both of these are laminated, and these are on every ECMO circuit that is uh, connected to a patient. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, I'll ask Grant to uh, weigh in since he is the um, our representative from CareLink. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Barrett. So uh, CareLink is our transfer center at Piedmont Atlanta. We are a 24-7 operation uh, manned with three nurses, a lot of which came from one of the cardiac ICUs. And then we have two call specialists. Our uh, What we try to do with every patient when we get a call for a transfer is to make it a one call uh, for the uh, referring physician. We want to get them connected to the right physician here and then uh, get uh, be very expedient with getting placement. So what we did is, and working with the ECMO team, is we kind of went over some keywords that uh, to look for from a referring physician. And especially with COVID, everybody's learned uh, the term ECMO, which makes it a lot easy for us. We also look for terms like uh, refractory shock or refractory uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure, ARDS, things that will tell us that this patient is above just a general ICU patient and needs a higher level of care than that. 
So when we get those calls, we will refer them to Dr. Barrett or one of his partners uh, for an ECMO evaluation. We're also always continually talking to the charge nurse in, um, in our cardiac ICUs, uh, to Gloria and to DJ, our, our cardiac ICU leadership uh, teams, uh, to know what our capacity to accept an ECMO patient is. That way we are uh, able to give the referring physician a very clear picture of we have a bed for an ECMO patient or not. Uh, we will always connect so uh, so our ECMO physicians can speak with them. And then on the back end, um, especially when uh, while code was rampant, we had a list of 10 to 12 patients at any one time uh, needing an ECMO bed from as far away as Arkansas and, and Michigan. And so we would uh, keep the list uh, and go over it uh, daily with Dr. Barrett, and he would let us know kind of what he was thinking so we could start preparing for the insurance uh, reviews and working on transport uh, in the event that a bed became available and we were able to go and, uh, and get the patient. Uh, next slide, please. And next slide. And I'd like to ask uh, Milton, our chief uh, perfusionist, to uh, expound on our, our current equipment. Thank you, Dr. Barrett. Uh, we currently have 12 Levanova SEPC platforms, which allows us to run about 10 ECMOs at a time. Uh, we use the Quadrox oxygenator along with the Soren Revolution centrifugal pump. Uh, on those circuits, which you can't see in the picture, we have ECMO supplies, which are disposable cannulation supplies, our disposable cannula, cannulas. Uh, sterile tubing clamps and tubing scissors along with sterile drapes that allow us to go all over the hospital from the the patient's bed in the ICU to the ER to the OR and we can pretty much get on ECMO within uh, no longer than 10 minutes. Uh, we also added four tandem light sparks for our travel uh, outside of the hospital. Uh, it makes for a nice small footprint on ambulance and airplanes. And we can also do two transports simultaneously. Thank you, Milton. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'd ask Julian, who is uh, also a perfusionist, who is involved with our training for our nurses, respiratory therapists, and APPs. Thank you, Dr. Barrett. Um, so as talked about earlier by Gloria, we are a one-to-one -one, um, nursing staff uh, at the bedside. And so they require some specific training. They go through initial training, um, didactic portion, and we have a, also have an ECMO lab that we um, try to set up and mimic the ICU um, setting. And they go through a two-day course with that. And then also they are trained at the bedside by other ECMO nurses. Um, perfusion also, we are there to support them 24-7 um, to make sure if there's any problems with the oxygenator or any, any other issues uh, that might arise with that. And also the APPs are um, a big, big help with uh, managing those patients. So um, we've, uh, the, and also the RNs do receive an annual recertification um, so they can you know, make sure that they have any questions. We can update them on any um, new updates with uh, the equipment, cannulas, um, or any problems that they've seen um, throughout the year. They can update us and uh, make sure you know, we're all on the same page. And this is just a big, it's a big team effort. And um, I just uh, put a shout out to our nursing staff right now. It's, they do a great job. So thank you, Dr. Barrett. Thank you, Julian. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. So um, again, if you're just starting out or you're thinking about starting out, just take care of uh, your own people first. Uh, gain experience before you think about branching out and going uh, to uh, uh, other places. Uh, as you can see, we really didn't um, transport or go anywhere for about the first decade uh, that we were doing this. Uh, we really initiated transport in about 2018, and uh, we're probably doing about uh, 
40 uh, transports a year uh, or or more. In 2021, uh, we embarked on a, a air transport program uh, as well. We've been down to the um, southeast uh, and we've, we've gone across the country as well. But um, just uh, be patient, let your program grow uh, slowly but steadily. Uh, don't get too ambitious is, uh, is a word of advice. Um, next slide, please. So our first ground transport, we went to uh, a sister facility. It's about a 75 minute uh, ambulance ride. Um, and uh, we, uh, we had drilled before that. We had worked out all the logistics and kinks. Uh, the photo on the uh, left hand side there saying first generation. That was a, a soaring circuit that we stripped down uh, to the bare minimum. It's a little bulky, a little clunky, weighs 67 kilos, uh, but we uh, had uh, no difficulty uh, with it as well. Uh, we've gone to a smaller uh, second generation device now. Uh, we are not plugging any particular product. Uh, this is the one we uh, uh, initially chose. It has a very small footprint, as you can see. Uh, that was one of the uh, uh, big features of it. Also, it only weighs uh, 16 pounds as well. But uh, transportation, uh, we uh, rely heavily on our CareLink uh, program uh, to get uh, logistics organized for us. And one of the benefits of being uh, a system is that everybody is, or everybody soon will be uh, all on one electronic medical record so that when uh, like Grant will give me a call for a consult, uh, we will log on to our, our uh, electronic medical record. We'll pull up x-rays, we'll pull up lab work, uh, we'll pull up uh, all things that we can see just to ensure truth in advertising because um, some programs just want to move people out of their facility uh, to a higher level of care. And most of the time, that's a correct thing to do. Sometimes it isn't. So um, we, uh, we are fortunate in being on one uh, electronic medical record. Uh, next slide, please. So at least in the United States, the most common form of air ambulance is a Lear 45, which uh, this represents. And um, again, when we embarked on an air um, uh, transport program, uh, we had the logistics worked out that they could accommodate the number of people that we would take because our transport program involves um, uh, a cannulating physician, uh, a perfusionist, uh, a uh, advanced practice provider, and the air ambulance people will provide a respiratory therapist to manage the travel vent uh, and or their own uh, flight uh, nurse as well. Um, it always takes longer than you think to get this arranged. Uh, realistically, for an air transport, it probably is 48 hours to 72 hours. So that's why you at least hope a referring institution will contact you early, as opposed to the patient will expire in 12 hours, because you're not going to get there in probably 12 hours or so. We have not used a helicopter. Uh, we have just gone by a fixed wing. Um, and even though this looks like a decent sized plane, it's a tight fit. Next. And this, the, uh, you can see with the, the smaller footprint uh, with uh, the uh, travel circuit, it still is very tight in there. Uh, the photo on the right, um, a lot of people thought we were a little nuts. We taking somebody with six chest tubes, but I assured everybody we were okay, and uh, and we were. So it is a tight fit in there, but it certainly um, can, can be done. Next slide, please. So we'd like to uh, uh, present a case to you of uh, a gentleman by the name of Blake Borgazzi. Blake was a 24-year-old gentleman who had just relocated to uh, Florida uh, from the Atlanta area. And he came down with COVID. Uh, he initially didn't go to the hospital. 
he was not vaccinated at that time. Uh, Blake subsequently wound up uh, in a hospital in South Florida, uh, rapidly deteriorating. And we got a call from Florida because there were literally no available ECMO circuits in the state of Florida at that time. So um, in, in again, trying to um, ascertain uh, they were not on uh, the same electronic medical record that, that we are. So uh, we relied on um, their uh, clinical observations and information. And at the end of our consultation, I concluded that Blake had, at that point in time, single organ failure, but because of refractory hypoxia, was headed towards uh, renal failure and, and other things. So this was our first uh, air transport and um, we, again, with our CareLink department and our case management department, uh, in, ensured that um, uh, there was uh, financial resources uh, to cover this. Uh, I did obtain emergency privileges uh, at this hospital in South Florida. Uh, we uh, made arrangements for ambulances on both ends. And uh, again, this took about uh, 48 to 72 hours uh, to get done. We actually went uh, uh, on a weekend because uh, we ran into a, a, a couple of delays, one of which was weather. But we went down, successfully cannulated Blake and brought him back to uh, Piedmont, Atlanta. Um, it became obvious to me uh, after a while that Blake's lungs were literally just disintegrating. And so we knew that um, uh, the only option would be a lung transplant for Blake. Uh, lungs are the one organ system we do not transplant here at uh, Piedmont Atlanta Hospital. So I embarked on calling um, multiple programs across the country um, and uh, trying to uh, get people uh, to take, uh, take Blake. And now this is about a year ago, so understandably, a lot of lung transplant programs were reluctant to take a COVID patient because just didn't know how that would how that would go. So while I was getting turned down by programs, um, I did in fact understand why. But um, we uh, persevered and uh, got uh, got a consent from uh, the University of Maryland. So after about 48 days, 50 days of taking care of Blake here. Uh, University of Maryland said, yeah, we'll take them, but you got to get them here. So again, uh, we had the air transport uh, process worked out uh, and then we got him up there for a, uh, a double lung transplant. So if we could um, show that uh, next slide. Well, Blake Bargatze wants to come back from a half months in one intensive care unit after another. The 24-year-old's lungs failed, forcing him to undergo a high-risk transplant surgery. And he has a message tonight for the other young people out there. Don't take this virus for granted. The Fox Medical Team's Beth Calvin has the story. Blake Bargatze, who grew up in Metro Atlanta, is the fourth person to complete a double lung transplant at the University of Maryland Medical Center after COVID-19 destroyed his lungs. And he wants to tell his story even though he can't talk right now. Blake Bargatze is behind the camera shooting this cell phone video. On the night in early April, he now believes he contracted COVID-19. The 24-year-old was enjoying live music at a West Palm Beach, Florida club. He has um, two chest tubes here. He's got one on the other side. And now, more than three months later, Blake's mom, Cheryl Niclo, is behind the camera shooting this video in the ICU at the University of Maryland Medical Center, eight days after Blake underwent a double lung transplant. It's scary. I try not to think too far in the future. Before his ordeal, his mother says Blake was healthy with no underlying medical conditions, but he did vape. And he's the only one in his family, she says, who passed on the COVID-19 vaccine. But the night before he got intubated, he wanted it. So a little bit 
too late then. Because within days of that show, Bargatze, struggling to breathe, was placed on a ventilator in a South Florida ICU and getting sicker by the day. And Piedmont Healthcare's Dr. Peter Barrett agreed to fly down to West Palm Beach from Atlanta to place Bargatze on a kind of life support machine known as an ECMO circuit. The medical personnel at that hospital were having difficulty because his lungs were already failing. They were having trouble oxygenating him or ventilating him. And so um, he was in rough shape. Barrett says ECMO would clear the carbon dioxide waste from Bargatze's blood and supply oxygen to his organs to try to buy his lungs time to fight off this virus. He was airlifted to Piedmont Hospital in Atlanta. We had him for, my recollection is 48 days. It became clear that that his lungs weren't going to recover. I'll be honest, when Dr. Barrett told me he was going to need a lung transplant, I was like, no. No. You got this all by yourself, Blake. But Bargassi wanted to push forward with the surgery. He wants to live. There you go. It was a tremendous team effort, but we persisted and, and got him up to um, University of Maryland. Hey, Blake, you get tired? And that's where Bargassi underwent a double lung transplant June 28th. Still on a ventilator, unable to speak, he wants to talk, so his mom reads his lips. He's saying he wants more people to get the vaccine because he doesn't want them to go through what he's gone through. And Blake Bargatze is facing a long road back. He says he can't really move his feet, can't raise his hands. He's going to be in a lot of therapy for a while. But he's doing very well, but it's it's, it's hard. It's, it's horrible. COVID is real. It's not gone. People need to be aware and be careful. And Blake Bargatze wants to say thank you to the family of his organ donor and to say thank you to all of the people out there who have been praying for him and supporting his family during this ordeal. For your Fox Medical Team, I'm Beth Galvin. Uh, next slide, please. Blake and Cheryl, thank you so much for joining me today to, to give an update on how Blake is doing um, after having received ECMO treatment at Piedmont Atlanta Hospital. Um, so Blake, if you wouldn't mind just starting our conversation, tell me a little bit about a day in your life today. Day in my life today, I mean, not a whole lot has changed. I'm still working remote. I've been with the same company for going on uh, a little over two years now. I'm currently in the business finance field. Um, you know, other than being on a bunch of different medications to, you know, kind of keep me uh, level with my uh, my transplant, uh, it's, I'm pretty much back to normal at this point. You know, we're living in Baltimore for the time being and kind of just counting down the days until I can come back home to Atlanta. Is there anything you're still kind of getting back to normal? Anything you're still learning to do again or or not? Not so much as learning as I am just working on my endurance, mm -hmm. but a lot of that just boils down to having a different set of lungs. But um, there's not a whole lot that I wasn't that I can't do now that I was able to do beforehand. Cheryl, you're Blake's mm -hmm. mom, obviously joining yes. us, um, his tireless advocate by his side for all of this. Mm -hmm. Going back to the thick uh, of Blake's battle with COVID, when did the option of ECMO? first come up? I flew down to Florida when he was on the ventilator and um, they they didn't have ECMO at the hospital. And at this point, he was only, he, he went to the emergency room on the 10th. He got intubated on the 13th. That's when I flew down. And um, talking to his physis physicians, it was apparent that he was going to need it, but he was really unstable. And then they were only looking in a certain area radius. No, There's nothing available. Um, I actually used to work at Piedmont um, years ago. And I knew that they had a really good program. And reached out to, um, I asked the, the group, the Florida group, could they call Piedmont and see if they would take him. And Dr. Barrett said yes. So he actually flew down on a weekend and cannulated him down in, Flo in West Palm Beach and flew him back. I think the general feeling was that he would probably be flown up there, placed on ECMO and be off in a week or so or less, you know, because he was young, healthy, no pre-existing. And 
I think it was just kind of a surprise that he became so sick, so sick. How important was the time that ECMO bought to get to that point? If he had not have been on ECMO, I honestly believe he would not have made it out of Florida within a few more days. He was that critical. Um, yeah, no, it, it bought him enough time to save his life. When I talked to him about the transplant and explained to him, this is your choice because you, you can't live with ECMO. You can't live without it. So what do you want? And he's like, well, if I have a lung transplant, can I keep my job? Will you call my boss? And I did. And Jim said, absolutely. So, you know, that's with him. He had had a reason. He had a reason. He wanted his family. He wanted his friends. He wanted he wanted his life. What are you most enjoying now, Blake? Um, I just, just being alive at this point. How about being um, with your mom? Well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> That's the right answer. Like I said, ECMO is scary, but you just, it was a means, it was a means to an end. A means to an, to a life. How about that? A means to a new beginning. Next slide, please. So um, we'll be happy to answer any of your questions. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us, um, there, the contact information will be provided. Um, but uh, the real keys are, this is a team effort. So um, select your members carefully. Make sure that they're fully um, invested in this. This is like building any championship program. Uh, you want people that see the vision. You want to help develop them. You want to grow them. You want to support them. And start out small. It's just a real word of advice. Don't overreach. Uh, but um, you, can, you can certainly do this. Jamie? you have any questions? Thank you, Dr. Barrett, and thank you to the Piedmont team. I, I will have to say that um, when we were uh, last year during a periodic survey, um, this, uh, this uh, case uh, was presented to us, the survey team, and um, if you all are, uh, those of you who are experienced with, with DMV surveys, we always end with noteworthy efforts. Um, and this was definitely a noteworthy effort and something that I, I felt was worthy to highlight um, to, uh, to the country and beyond so that you can get an idea of, um, of how a loop can be closed on a very difficult situation. Um, and definitely this was a, uh, uh, for all of us, uh, an ability to close that loop with a great outcome. And um, it, it's all from being able to, to have a, as Dr. Barrett was saying, a, a cast of professionals that can make everything happen. Um, so thank you for that. Um, at this point, we don't have any questions as of yet, but um, what I'm gonna do is pitch a few questions to you all. I think Andrew may also have a few questions um, as we uh, harvest some questions from our, our team that's uh, uh, signed in with us. Feel free to use the chat function again to ask your questions. Um, and Andrew will uh, survey those and uh, bring them to the team. The first question I have is uh, there's, there seems to be some different platforms um, for an approach to ECMO in-house, and one is a perfusion lead and one is an RN lead. Can you describe uh, your platform and how did you come about that platform? Um, well, I'll let Gloria take the lead on that one, uh, but uh, historically we have been a um, one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, nurse uh, program. For the uh, initial reason, uh, about a decade ago, uh, there were more nurses than there were perfusionists um, in terms of if you just want uh, numbers. But uh, I'll let Gloria expound on that. Thanks, Dr. Barrett. So Dr. Barrett is correct. You know, when we started the ECMO program, 
there were more there were more nurses than there were infusions in house, and so we decided to go to that approach where the nurses could be one to one. And what Julian was speaking of earlier was that was that intent training that we had to have, um, meaning the nurses were going to classes for two days, and. In most programs that you see across the country is they have a perfusionist that's leading that program. But Piedmont want to do something a little bit different. And we decided to get our nurses um, experienced enough and they were considered our ECMO specialists. And what that means is they were caring for the patient 24-7. Of course, we have perfusion in-house to come and help when we need them. But they were the experts at that time meaning that if anything were to happen, we set up a lot of policies, a lot of procedures, protocols that we could use so that nurse can be efficient at the bedside. Um, and so just bringing that that program ahead, um, of course, through our COVID time, we did have some staffing challenges, but we are still a nurse-led program where we are uh, monitoring one-to-one. As far as perfusion, I'll let Julian or Milton speak on the perfusions piece. So um, perfusion is obviously 24-7 available for the nurses to, uh, if they have any questions or if there are any problems arise with the circuit. Um, here at Piedmont, our policy is that the perfusionists are the only ones that are allowed to access the circuit, meaning if we have to draw labs, um, changing any components, um, and we are uh, you know, available for that. Uh, a lot of other centers, they, they tend to have a uh, perfusionist or ECMO specialist at the bedside watching maybe a group of a cohort of ECMO patients, um, which uh, you, you have a, a nur nurse taking care of the patient and then you would have either ECMO specialist being a nurse, RT, or a perfusionist taking care of that. And I think each facility is different. They, they have their own policies. Um, to help um, control that. And uh, we, we started ours, uh, we based ours off of the Michigan model. Um, we had a perfusionist um, in 2013 um, go uh, and, and see what, what they were doing there. And uh, that model seemed to fit for us for Piedmont. Um, and, and also from a financial standpoint, it is um, beneficial as well. <laughs> um, for it's, it, you, you have uh, the nurse there at the bedside and then the perfusionists can, you know, just it can go about their daily rounds, routines, being in the OR and things like that. And we have somebody available, so. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I add that also with our, uh, the way we do it, we have everything standardized. So we don't, some institutions have multiple platforms for their ECMO circuit. So we have one and with the intense training, they become, you know, very well uh, familiar with, with our circuit. And then, you know, they, they call perfusion 24 seven. We do all transports within with this CAT scan, um, OR surgery and everything like that comes with that. So it's a really good, um, relationship with perfusion and nursing to make it very, very collaborative. I just want to add that. Thank you, Milton. Andrew, looks like we have a question. We do. Yes. Thank you, Jamie. And thank you, Deidre, for asking. Um, so the question is, how has becoming a DMV ECLS certified center improved your overall performance and patient outcomes as an ECMO provider? Um, well, we um, uh, we do strive for continuous improvement and being um, uh, certified by DNV. Uh, part of the DNV accreditation process is uh, DNV will come and visit you every year as opposed to every three years. So they will uh, keep you on your toes. Uh, and as Jamie said, uh, at the end, it's like, okay, what are you going to do next year? How are you going to get better? How are you going to grow? And that makes you stop and think. And uh, we like that. It's basically, you don't ever want to get complacent. Uh, and again, if they, if they find something, 
uh, at, at least working with Jamie and his team, nothing has ever been um, uh, a negative experience because again, their, their corrective action plans uh, are open-ended. Uh, they'll say, how are you gonna fix it? Uh, as opposed to being one size fits all, somewhat uh, prescriptive, uh, and it's probably not the right term, but it, nothing is ever punitive. It's always about getting better. And part of the uh, part of this is that they're they're here every year, and uh, they they make you better. I don't know if anybody else has a thought on that. Um, yeah, I also wanted to say, with the first with our first sur initial survey with ECMO, it really helped us. Um, do a lot of housekeeping with our policies and procedures and look at um, how how we can um, advance our program, but also how we can kind of clean up where, where we're getting things. We can find things much more efficiently now. Um, we, we know who our cannulators are. We, we define that. So there's not, you don't have a lot of people asking, you know, I'm going to do an ECMO. Well, our, we know who our ECMO physicians are, who our ECMO uh, cannulators are, who are who are providers that are taking care of ECMO, and it really helps build that team atmosphere. And uh, I, I just really thought it it uh, brought us up up another level. So, yeah, just to piggyback on that, the process improvement will allow us to scale the growth of our program. Uh, efficiently and safely. So I think that's really big for our hospital. Very good. Thank you. Um, for programs that are developing um, in with the, the context of education and physician credentialing, how did that platform work for you all? Let's start with with staff uh, training. Um, how did you identify those groups that needed training? What level should they be trained to? And then with med staff, how was that same approach for your cannulating physicians? And how did they get to that point of being credentialed to cannulate? Um, well, part of that was, um, and to your point, Jamie, is that you, you really do want to uh, start or develop a program uh, honestly with a limited number of people uh, you don't uh, it is a procedure and a process that uh, gets better um, with experience uh, just like uh, most uh, surgical procedures uh, volume and experience matters so um, we have uh, set a number uh, of cannulations that we um, would like to see our uh, credential cannulating physicians. Uh, most of the cannulators are either uh, some interventional cardiologists, uh, cardiac surgeons. And uh, we, if someone is not having enough cannulations, uh, we do have a simulation lab for them. Uh, and um, between Julian and myself, uh, we'll proctor and go over um, this with them um, and it's about uh, if you know somebody really doesn't doesn't keep up they will they will come off the team and when it comes to the nursing staff it's this it's the same process that we do fall through is we do have that rigorous teaching um, education um, our nurses are not only just taking ECMO classes, but we have a variety of classes which involves hemodynamics and um, multi um, circulatory devices, the mechanical devices. So all that is entailed to where our nurses are staying efficient. Um, we do, because of our annual recertification, we do have a simulation lab, not only for our providers, but also for our nurses where they can go in and have that hands-on training and where you can answer questions and things of that nature. 
so the continuous building of how we continue to educate our staff, whereas providers or nurses, that's what makes our program great is because that is not just a one-stop process. We're always reviewing quality metrics. We have quality metrics for our hospital, but when it also comes to our ECMO program, we also define metrics for that program and what our nurses do at the bedside as long as what our providers and perfusionists need to do. And we, it's like Milton said, it's a collaborative care. We Not only does that string rich process for our nurses, but also when we deal with our respiratory therapists and also our, um, our um, physical therapist team. Okay, Andrew, looks like we have a couple other questions in the uh, chat box. We do. Uh, so from Tara, uh, she would like to know um, how long after starting a program should we consider becoming DMV certified? Um, I would think probably you could have probably 20 to 25 uh, ECMO um, uh, runs uh, under your program because then you probably will have identified areas of weakness or areas of things to improve upon. Um, honest answer is there's no set limit, but um, you do need a little bit of experience. Uh, but having said that, uh, applying uh, for DNV, uh, as Julian uh, mentioned earlier, uh, can get you uh, really focused. Uh, DNV can tell you um, what you're missing, what you might have overlooked. Uh, we're certainly willing to uh, to help any program uh, in in that regard. Uh, but I would think you probably need about 20 to 25. Uh, what do you guys think? I I agree with that, and I think you're. I mean, even with us, with, you know, thousand plus ECMO runs, we're always finding something that we can improve on. So, but 25 to, you know, even maybe even, even 30 runs that, you know, I definitely, you can see, you, you've seen a wide variety of patients, hopefully by that point, And you can see if you need to, you know, for example, um, how, how you transport your patients around your facility um getting to ct scan doing mock runs on how to safely and efficiently get there um is something we did in the past um and making sure we have you know the right oxygen hookups and things like that you're gonna always find something that you know you go now you're going to a inter interventional radiology room and they have completely different hookups for for gas and we have to make sure we have gas lines for that i mean those are simple things that can be fixed but over time you're going to find those find those issues um but and we i think with dv and like i said before with the policies policies and procedures um we kind of had policies and procedures from perfusion we had policies and procedures for nursing we had, um, you know, even we needed and we needed to develop more policies and procedures for our physical therapists and our respiratory therapists, which how how that gets them involved. So uh, we were able to clean that up and really streamline it. And that that was that was I, I, I thought super helpful for us. So and then also I wanted to mention, too, we were talking about the education um, piece. Uh, we, we have a three kind of a three tier system here where we have uh, experts we have um, which are which are our perfusionists and physicians and then we have um, our competent staff which are our APPs and our nurses and they're uh, the, be the bedside nurses and then we also have um, people like uh, food service and things that are also trained and they're just ECMO aware. So we have classes for everybody all over the hospital to make them aware of, of what, and depending on which level they are, we can um, make them aware of ECMO, so. Thank you, Julian. If I may uh, segue uh, also from what you all were speaking of with, with by way of uh, the cannulation numbers, referencing Aaron again, um, we look at a minimum of six months of collected data. Um, and Jermaine, to Dr. Barrett's point, 
those 25 cannulations may take place over that period of time, depending on how what your volume looks like. But at least uh, by way of a time frame, Aaron, um, at least six months of collected data, indeed. Andrew, any other questions? Yes, uh, actually, we have several at this point. Uh, so the next one is from Amy. She would like to know, uh, what type of initial and yearly training do you require for the physicians that are managing your ECMO patients? Um, are there any didactic sessions that are required in addition to the simulations? Um, well, ECMO, um, uh, that's a good question because um, ECMO management is separated from uh, ECMO cannulation because say uh, there is a, a a STEMI patient that comes in at uh, two in the morning uh, is in cardiogenic shock, a uh, balloon pump or an impella device isn't giving you uh, adequate support, uh, the interventional cardiologist can, uh, can place, uh, a certain number of interventional cardiologists can place someone uh, on ECMO support. However, ec ongoing ECMO management uh, is limited to uh, a very few people, uh, uh, basically um, uh, several um, intensivists uh, are the ones that are, are managing minute to minute uh, in that time frame. Um, so I hope that answered the, the first part of the question. And I'm sorry, what was the second part? Uh, the second part is, um, are there any didactic sessions that are required in addition to the simulations? I think that. Not for our, our intensivists or physicians, we don't have a di didactic program for them. We have had uh, other facilities uh, in our Piedmont family uh, come and take our, our nursing course. And we did have some eight, um, uh, nurse practitioners and one physician come and, and just listen in with, with along with the nursing. Um, but we, we currently don't have a didactic program for our portion for our physicians. We, we just have the simulation. We go over, Dr. Barrett will go over cannulation, uh, review our equipment that we use because we do have a standard um, ECMO um, cannulating equipment that we are our disposable equipment that we use, uh, which we standardize all our cannulas and wires. So uh, we like to make our uh, new onboarding physicians aware of, of how we cannulate here at Piedmont. Okay, thank you. And so uh, there's another question. This one is from Michael. Um, he would like to know, what did you come up with for a minimum number of cannulations and how did you arrive at this number? I am more concerned about the numbers for non-surgeons cannulating. Um, so this was, these numbers came um, out of um, uh, just our uh, decade plus of experience. Uh, again, most of the, um, most of our interventional cardiologists uh, are used to using uh, larger cannulas, such as for uh, impella. I mean, the impella sheath is a 14 French. Our standard uh, venous cannulas are either 23 French or 25 French. Uh, for men, we use a 17 French arterial. And for women, we use a 15 French arterial. So it was born out of uh, a, a real-world experience what our... Um, uh, what our physicians do in the cath lab. All cardiac surgeons are used to large cannulas uh, on a daily basis. So that, that's how that uh, evolved and, and came about. Um, and the, the number, uh, again, as Jamie said, they, they're looking for six months of data. Uh, if we have someone who is applying for cannulation privileges, I will proctor, supervise them. Uh, as far as non-surgeons or um, uh, non-interventional cardiologists, uh, we we don't have anybody that has cannulating or management privileges. Um, that may be right. That may be wrong. That's probably a a local uh, hospital uh, political battle. Uh, but I will tell you 
uh, really do limit the number of people that do manage these patients because you don't want somebody managing a patient once every six weeks that's just not in the patient's best interest. Um, so whatever you do, uh, it, you know your local environment best, uh, but initially keep it small so that you can easily control your quality and easily have your, your people and your program gain the necessary experience. Okay, thank you. And uh, we have another question from Deidre. Uh, she would like to know, how do you follow your ECMO patient population from out for outcome metrics post-discharge? Um, well, most of our, um, uh, obviously our, our, our patients that um, uh, complete or survive their ECMO run uh, generally wind up at uh, physical therapy um, and or, you know, or go to an LTAC facility. Uh, but we have sent um, some questionnaires uh, uh, just when COVID uh, hit us. Uh, we were working on a, um, uh, an ECMO uh, follow-up clinic. Uh, and, um, but we, we have sent out questionnaires to our, uh, our patients um, surveys, uh, quality of life survey, things along those lines. Um, I hope that answers that question. Dr. Barrett, if I may ask a quick question too for our international uh, colleagues, um, you had mentioned that there was a uh, some some form of a consortium that was an international presence for ECMO. Can you elaborate on that? Um, well, there is a, um, it's the uh, COVID Critical Care Consortium, uh, which is uh, based out of um, Queensland, Australia. Uh, that uh, came about uh, by Dr. Um, uh, John Frazier, Gills Peak, uh, who did the um, uh, CSER trial. And uh, uh, a group of us got together and said, the only way that we're going to try to not the only way, but a way to try to get through this pandemic would be to try to aggregate and share uh, real life data uh, from all around the world. So uh, we uh, we signed on right away for that, uh, and it was labor intensive uh, to uh, to provide the data. Um, but uh, we recently had a paper out which um, reviewed 40,000 COVID ECMO patients. Uh, uh, from around the world. This is still an ongoing um, project. Uh, it will be, um, uh, the first time we'll all be able to meet in person will be um, in May of this year at Euro Elso in London. Um, and it, uh, uh, we're all looking forward to that, but it is an ongoing project. Uh, and um, you can find it on the web. It's the um, uh, COVID Critical Care Consortium uh, slash uh, ECMO card, and uh, they're they're looking for uh, ongoing participants. If you have particular research interests, uh, there they have a section on uh, um, ECMO, uh, which I'm one of the uh, sub leads on that. They have a section on uh, hemostasis. They have a section on uh, acute kidney injury. Uh, there's now a section opening up on long COVID. Uh, neurologic um, prognostication. So it's a very robust program. Thank you, sir. Okay, I'm mindful of your time. It is 1.13 according to my computer. Uh, we have no further questions in our chat function, and I think we've addressed all of them uh, from top to bottom. Unless we have any other questions, I would like to personally thank our friends and colleagues at Piedmont Atlanta, Piedmont Heart, for their time today and uh, best of wishes. And to all of our attendees, thank you so much for joining us. It was very meaningful for us to have you join us uh, to talk about uh, ECMO and uh, Piedmont's approach to ECMO, as well as uh, the case study that they presented. So with that, 
I bid you all adieu. And until we see each other again, thank you so much and appreciate your time. And thank you again to our Piedmont Atlanta uh, colleagues. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.